All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another installment of the Interstellar Probe Study webinar series. My name is James Misandria, and I am the Deputy Study Manager for the Interstellar Probe Study. Thank you very much for tuning in to today's webinar. We have a wonderful webinar today on the engineering mission trade space. And after the presentation, we will have a question and answer session. Before we start, I would like to outline the logistics of today's event. As a member of the audience, your audio and video are off. During the presentation, please submit your questions in the question and answer feature, and please indicate which panelist your question is for. During the question and answer session, I will start with questions with the largest amount of upvotes and proceed down the list. Also, for more information about the Interstellar Probe Study and for information on future webinars, please visit the Interstellar Probe Study website. And now I'd like to introduce today's speakers, who are all from the Interstellar Probe Study engineering team. Jim Kinnison has been at APL for 35 years building spacecrafts, most recently leading the Parker Solar Probe mission as the mission system engineer, and he is the concept study system engineer for the Interstellar Probe Study. Prior to that, he was the system assurance manager for the New Horizons mission to Pluto. Wayne Schley has been at APL for three years and has held several mission design and technical development lead positions for various space flight projects. This includes being the deputy mission designer for the New Horizons mission and the lead mission designer for the Interstellar Probe study. David Copeland has been at APL for 13 years and has over 35 years of experience in communication systems. He is the telecommunications lead for the Parker Solar Probe mission and the Dragonfly mission, and he is the telecommunications lead for the Interstellar Probe study. And now for the presentations. Jim, the virtual floor is yours. Thanks, James. Uh, so for the folks who hey, have uh, seen previous webinars, uh, this one's going to be a little bit different today. Uh, in past webinars, we've talked a lot about the really cool science that a mission like Interstellar Probe would be able to do if it escaped from the heliosphere. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what such a mission might look like, what the concepts uh, might look like, and what the trade space associated with those uh, the concepts would be. <clears throat> and with that, uh, James, if you could go to the next slide. So I thought I would start with a quick review uh, for, again, for those who have seen uh, some of the previous webinars. You might have heard that we have multiple trajectory options that we're considering, and I show them uh, here on the top left. Uh, there are two different flavors of a Jupiter gravity assist and uh, one flavor of a solar overth maneuver, which is a, essentially a gravity assist very close to the sun. Um, each of those possible means of uh, escaping the solar system. Uh, and we, we're developing concepts basically to cover the space of uh, what, what a mission might look like using any of those trajectories. Uh, in addition, uh, you've probably heard the science team talking about uh, the types of science that could be done and the types of instruments that might be flown. Um, we really have multiple payload options, and uh, one of the things that the science team has done for us is to develop what we call a surrogate payload or, or candidate payload, which is really just, just there to help us understand what the constraints are on a flight system uh, associated with the kinds of instruments you might want to fly for a heliospheric mission. And in addition, they're also looking at what, what might be added to a payload should we want to do a planetary mission or an astrophysics, uh, what we call an augmentation. And that helps us understand what the range of payload masses and powers are, what the data re rate requirements are, uh, all of the kinds of things that you might have to do if you wanted to, to understand what a flight system uh, might look like. And I do show you what a flight system might look like here in the, in the bottom picture on this slide. Uh, this is a, about a two meter spacecraft with about a five meter uh, high gain antenna. Um, and you can see one of two possible RTGs that we would use to power the system. And in addition, you can see that we've, we've developed some booms and, and such to, uh, to help get the instruments out past the dish so that they would be able to have the clear fields of view that they need to do the science. So James, why don't you go ahead and another slide. And just for an operational scenario, let me just remind everybody again of what we're talking about. We're talking about a mission um, that would launch sometime in the early 2030s potentially and would really be conducted in three phases, an inner heliosphere phase uh, out to about 70 AU, an outer heliosphere phase from 70 to about 250 AU, and then an interstellar phase that's out past 250 AU. And I would remind you that uh, as, as has been talked about in previous mission and previous webinars, uh, this mission really has different kinds of science to be done in each of these regions uh, with different cadences and different kinds of measurements to be made. And so we're really looking at, a, at an end-to-end -end mission, not just simply get out of the heliosphere as quickly as possible, but how do you study the heliosphere all along the way? 
And James, could you go to the next slide? So one of the first considerations we have is just how big can this spacecraft be and how much can it carry? And so we've, we've been looking at that uh, for both cases with the Jupiter gravity assist, both our ballistic case and also a powered case where we would carry a, a solid rocket motor with us to Jupiter and fire that during the gravity assist. And uh, in, the, in the table on the right, you can see kind of what the launch masses would be associated with missions like this, somewhere in the 860 to 930 range. Um, I also give you a little bit of an idea of how much of that is used up in propellant. And then uh, also we need to carry mass reserves at this, at this stage of the game. And so we've included in these numbers, uh, you know, the, the kinds of mass reserves that NASA would require for, uh, for uh, mission study. The mass drivers for the mission are obviously the payload um, and also the high gain antenna, which as you saw was a very large construct. Uh, that's a five meter solid dish. And so it takes up quite a bit of the, the mass that's associated with these spacecraft. Um, and you'll see later on that we are actually doing a, a significant number of trades here to understand how to make that high gain antenna lighter um, and how to make it more robust. Um, and also for the, for the system, the RTGs in themselves and the required structure associated with our, our big mass drivers, there's not a whole lot of trades we can do associated with those, but we are trying to understand how best to optimize um, the ways that we, that we connect the RTGs with our spacecraft. Um, I, would, I would also mention that along with the HGA size uh, trade, we are looking at um, ways to um, change the payload um, that could optimize the, the use of the spacecraft as well. And one of the significant results that you'll see uh, that Wayne will talk about a little bit later is that we found that uh, for a given target, for a given trajectory, the flyout speed is really a, a function of mass. Um, and, and so there is some tailoring that can be done across the spacecraft that, that would allow us to trade uh, mass of the spacecraft for flyout speed or speed at, at uh, 100 AU. And that trade actually is, is uh, something that's actually pretty beneficial for us. So James, if you could go to the next one, please. Looking at power, um, I show you here a quick block diagram. Uh, I know it's very small and it's hard to see, um, but basically what we're talking about is a spacecraft that has all the usual components. There's an avionics system with single board computers and solid state recorders. Uh, there's a guidance and control system with typical instruments that you would use uh, to, to control the attitude of the spacecraft. Um, there's a power system that's used to interface the RTG with the spacecraft and then distribute power uh, across the various pieces of the, of the spacecraft and all, also a telecom system, uh, among other things uh, that I think Dave Copeland will talk about just a little bit later. Um, we are considering powering the, a system like this with two next-gen RTGs. Um, we're assuming consistent uh, characteristics for those RTGs as has been used in, for instance, the recent uh, decadal, planetary decadal mission concept studies. Uh, so these RTGs uh, are relatively well, um, rel relatively understood right now. Um, our critical power mode is the end of life. Uh, while we're both downlinking data and also operating the instruments, most of the instruments that we're considering would want to operate pretty continuously. And so we're trying to provide for that mode. And I show you what a, what a very high level uh, uh, power uh, condition would be, power system would be during this uh, circumstances. Um, for a total RTG capability of 300 watts uh, at 50 years, we can probably power a system like this uh, for something around 233, 230 watts, um, which gives us a, a reasonable margin compared to that capability, even at 50 years. All right, so if you go to the next one, James. So just quickly for a spacecraft concept summary, what we think will come out of a study like this is a spacecraft somewhere in the 850 to 950 kilogram range. Again, as I said, powered by two next generation RTGs. Um, payloads on the order of 85 to 95 kinds of kilograms in that range um, with the ability to trade lighter and heavier payloads um, with, for instance, um, the ability to get to 100 AU a little bit faster. There are other options that could be considered, um, and I show you some of those, and you've heard about those in, we in previous webinars as well. Um, we are in the middle of doing some pretty serious telecom trades, and I think Dave will, will definitely want to fill you in on those. We're looking at a KA band versus X band trade to, uh, that would allow us to achieve the data, data downlink rates that we need, um, but do it with a smaller dish. Um, there are also ways that we could use uh, uh, more sophisticated antenna systems, even at X band, that would allow us to shrink the size of that dish. Um, and those are the kinds of things that we're looking at. <clears throat> in addition, we're looking at control systems. So one of the things that we found here recently is that uh, the kinds of instruments that we're considering, most of them really would like to have a spinning spacecraft. Um, however, there are some cases where we would be interested in having three axis control. And so we're looking for ways to integrate um, 
the ability to, to use both a spinning spacecraft and a three axis control system for various parts of the mission. So James, if we could go forward again. Spacecraft reliability is of course a big concern for a 50 year mission or more. Uh, and so there is a big effort right now to understand uh, how to make a long lived system, uh, something that will be uh, highly robust um, to allow us to, to uh, get out to uh, the 50 year mark with a pretty high probability. Um, we have a model that's being generated for this uh, based on the concept that we're developing. Um, what that model considers is both the science requirements and also the, the re redundancy of the system. Um, and so we're able to, to make some uh, interesting conclusions based on that, on, on the kinds of redundancy we need, for instance, especially in, in a potential payload. Uh, we're also uh, mining the historical record for long-lived missions uh, to better quantify time-dependent failure rates. Uh, we want to understand uh, how long missions last in space. And uh, so there will be some interesting results uh, from that uh, that will be uh, presented at a future webinar. And we're also, of course, keying into the physics of failure methods uh, for electronics, uh, electronic components, uh, for power supplies, for sensors, for instruments, and those sorts of things. Uh, and that's all being folded into the reliability model so that we can understand uh, not only what the reliability is, but what sort of testing needs to be done uh, before launch to be able to assure that we're going to make a 50 year lifetime. James, if you could go forward one. And of course, the ground segment's also got to be considered in all of this. Uh, and there, there are uh, pieces of this that are not typical for missions. Uh, it's very, not very often that we have to deal with a multi-generational uh, uh, operations team to be able to, to complete the mission. Here, we're definitely looking at uh, something that where we have to worry about things like ownership and upgrade uh, for computer systems, for ground systems, but also knowledge management to to allow people to take over jobs as, as people uh, move on to new things. Um, and so there's, a, there's a, a very strong component of this where we're trying to understand what a, what a long-lived team looks like and how we make that work. Uh, James, could you go forward one? And here's some of the things that we're looking at for that. Um, Interstellar Probe is definitely a pathfinder for these long duration missions. There will be more and more missions that are multi-decadal is coming up, um, especially as we're exploring the outer solar system and doing these kinds of missions um, uh, where we're going very far from the Earth. Uh, and so this is the kind of thing that, would, that I think more and more missions are going to be needing to, to consider. How do you have organizational consensus? How do you get people to commit to very long missions? Um, how do you keep the interest alive in that mission? And how do you, uh, how do you make sure that the stakeholder organizations uh, are, are maintaining the systems that they need to maintain for us to be able to, to do the mission? Um, so these are all questions, again, that I think will be addressed in a, in a future webinar coming up. James, could you go forward one for me? Great, so let me say a word real quickly about the solar overth maneuver. Uh, this is work to go forward for us in the concept. As I've said, uh, we're mostly right now developing a concept to be able to perform the Jupiter gravity assist flavor of this mission. Um, but there is a, a possibility that we could uh, do this solar orbit maneuver very close to the sun. Um, but one of the prime, of course, issues with that is protecting the spacecraft and the so solid rocket motor that's got to go along with the spacecraft. Uh, and I kind of show you a little bit of a chart here to show you the, the challenge that we're facing. So Parker Solar Probe uh, will uh, will reach less than 10 solar radii from the sun, probably about 9.8 uh, solar radii. And that's going to see temperatures in the 1500 uh, Kelvin range on the front face of its heat shield. If we were to, to perform a, uh, a, a gravity assist with interstellar probe, it's going to go much, much deeper, much, much closer to the sun. And we'll start seeing temperatures something like 3000, even up to 3500 or 4000, depending on how deep we go, uh, degrees Kelvin. And this is a considerably harder challenge uh, to develop this kind of a heat shield than even Parker Solar Probe had to deal with. Uh, right now, there's going to be, there, there's a preliminary effort to start looking at what kinds of materials might survive this sort of a, uh, an environment, um, but we're a long way from being able to produce a heat shield from that. Um, it is a high risk development, but because uh, it's being looked at, um, this is a concept that we're going to consider as we go forward in the next year, and you'll probably hear more about that at a future webinar in season two. So James, if you could go forward. So what is our path forward uh, for the engineering? Well, the first thing we want to do is take a deeper dive on the operations concept. We'll show you a little bit of the, where we are with that um, in Dave's presentation whenever he talks about uh, downlinking science data uh, across the mission. Uh, we have a bunch of concepts, uh, trade studies that we're doing right now that need to be folded into this concept. We'll be doing that. 
And then of course, there's the documentation of all this work that's been done. So I would uh, just ask you to tune into some of these conferences where we're gonna be presenting papers on this issue, um, especially the IEEE Aerospace Conference of, is uh, usually in March. Uh, and and uh, we'll be having several papers about a solar probe concept there. And also we'll, we'll be um, having a conference uh, in November, I believe it is, on the uh, interstellar probe itself. And so that uh, could be something of interest to you as well to see more about the concept. Um, the next step is we want to develop the changes to this concept as we, as we add augmentations that's been talked about. And then we need to develop the concept for the solar overt maneuver uh, case. And I think with that, James, that should be my last slide. I think we're ready to move on to the mission design with uh, Wayne Schley. Thanks, Jim. Uh, you can hit next, James. So I just wanted to start off first by formalizing some of our nomenclature, just uh, just to reference in, in shorthand pretty easily. So uh, our three trajectory options again are option one, we're gonna do a ballistic Jupiter gravity assist. So we uh, use a high powered launch vehicle with a couple of up, upper stages, uh, launch directly to Jupiter, get there quickly, and we do a low altitude flyby to gain as much speed as we can. Uh, and then escape the solar system. Uh, the second option is a powered Jupiter gravity assist. We go a little slower to Jupiter by uh, reserving a final stage, a four stage, uh, to again do a low altitude flyby, but then we burn that solid rocket stage um, uh, at Jupiter to uh, get some extra speed boost. And then the third option is our solar overearth maneuver. Uh, next, please. So um, we are primarily focused on doing what I call the A variant, which is a heliophysics focused mission uh, with the heliophysics payload. Um, I will talk briefly about a KBO variant to this. So um, the variant B, which does heliophysics as a prime with a little bit of KBO information, um, but that is just a, a nomenclature piece. We're focused on the 1A and 2A options. Uh, again, as, as James said, the uh, solar overearth option is intended for later in the interstellar probe study. Um, what we're trying to focus on here is a potential study destination, what kind of escape speeds we can get, um, and what are our mass trades given that we pick a, a tentative destination. Next, please. So uh, the 1A and 2A options are actually simple enough that we can evaluate almost an entire grid search on where we can go and how fast we can go uh, given a tentative time range uh, of launch. So um, we picked for this study a time range from 2030, the earliest we can launch to 2042 to accommodate an entire Jupiter cycle. And given that we know our launch configuration, an SLS block two, Atlas V Centaur as the third stage, and a star 48 BV as the final stage, uh, at least in the 1A option, or the, the, the powered flyby um, uh, motor for the 2A option. Uh, once we assume a mass, we can actually then just evaluate what kind of speed do I get to what areas of the sky for a given launch year. And that's what you see here on this map uh, for the 1A option. This is the whole sky uh, given per launch year, uh, how fast can I go, at least in terms of the color contour. So obviously when we do, when we want to go fast, when we want to get out of the solar system quickly, we want to try to stay towards these red and orange ranges. Uh, each year creates a, um, what I call a hot zone because of the, the red color. Um, so we want to try to stay near the ecliptic if we can to have a high speed. Um, I'll note that the the best speed available for this given mass is actually in 2032 towards Eris. And the, um, lowest, the lowest maximum speed for a given year is in 2037, uh, near the nose of the heliopause. Um, the general trend here is as we increase spacecraft mass, these zones tend to shrink in size and then they'll shift to the, to the east. Um, uh, that's just something to keep in mind as, as we talk about some of the trades regarding the mass. Uh, the, the primary thing we want to do uh, is establish a plausible target for heliophysics. So obviously, again, as I said, we want to we want a high speed. So that means we're trying to stay near the ecliptic. Another thing that's of high interest is we want to be near the nose, but not at the nose. Um, 
the point is being that we have a shorter distance, but then we also could potentially take like a side image of the, of the heliosphere um, as we're leaving and get some more information. So the idea there is we want to try to be roughly 45 degrees off of the nose, and that's indicated by the purple band. And then uh, you'll notice that there's a, another uh, grayscale contour on this plot. Um, that represents where the ibex ribbon is. And in particular, that's where the white areas of this gray contour are. So we wanna pick a target uh, for this study that somewhere resides in the intersection of those three pieces. And we ended up deciding that uh, an ecliptic longitude of 295 degrees and an ecliptic latitude of zero degrees represents that uh, indication. Can you hit next, please? So that's roughly the uh, location that we are using to um, uh, target for this study. It's very close to New Horizons, and it actually corresponds to the 2040-2041 uh, hot zone. Next, please. With a uh, with a zone in hand, with a, with a destination in hand, we can actually do a mass trade, um, assuming as we vary wet mass, what does that actually do to our speed output? And so you can actually see that trade here on the left. In the, on the x-axis, we have wet mass. On the y-axis, we have escape speed at 100 AU. And the black curve represents, oh, as I, as I aim for 295.0, what is that, how does, how does changing mass change the, the speed? So the interesting thing is, is that this ends up being actually very linear uh, with a slope of, as I add 50 kilograms, I lose 0.17 AU per year in speed. Now to 100 AU, that is roughly speaking about two months of flight time. Uh, for our destination here, our, our target mass it ended up being 860 kilograms for the 1A case that gives us an output speed of 7.32 AU per year. We can do the same thing for the 2A option. Can you hit next, please? So in this powered case, uh, we did the same analysis. Um, uh, however, you'll note that the speeds, the black curve here, these speeds are a little bit lower than the ballistic case for this particular target. Now, the reason why that is is because this 295.0 target is actually in between the middle of two hot zones, the, 230, the 239 hot zone and the 2041 hot zone for the powered case. The slope is roughly the same, and our, our mass estimate, which is a little higher, I'll get to that in a second, is 930 kilograms, and our speed is a little bit lower for this case at 7.07 .07 AU per year. Uh, next, please. With our tentative trajectories selected, we can actually put together a delta V budget, and this helps us uh, create our mass estimates. So um, our mission is very similar, in, uh, basically an analog of New Horizons, just going faster. So um, we use New Horizons as a base plate for um, creating some estimates in terms of what kind of TCMs we might need, uh, but we scaled it up because as we have higher C3, almost double of what New Horizons had in some cases. Um, we need a lot more uh, fuel to clean up more launch error and more um, uh, targeting. Uh, but in our 1A case, the only real uh, trajectory correction we need is to clean up launch and then target Jupiter. After that, we only need to do burns uh, basically for ACS uh, attitude control. Basically, and that's just to target Earth so that we can talk to Earth. Uh, next, please. For the 2A case, we have very much a similar thing. Uh, we have actually a lower C3 overall. Uh, so that means our delta V to do launch cleanup is reduced a little bit because we don't have to do as much because we have less C3. Um, however, we have to do maneuvers with a solid rocket motor attached to us. So we have, you know, an extra 2,000 kilograms to push around. So we have to bring more propellant as a result. Um, so it ends up being that the uh, 2A case actually needs a lot more propellant and therefore needs more mass. Um, so in, at this juncture, we can actually do a raw comparison um, between the A's and the B variants, so adding a KVO. 
um, as a as an extra target. Can you hit next, please? Now we don't have an actual target uh, selected at this point, but if we were, the only additional delta v that we would need is to do some three-axis control and also do uh, to basically take pictures of the KBO as we fly by. And then we also would need to do some extra TCM targeting, just like New Horizons did for Pluto and for Arakov. Uh, so this gives us at least a tentative estimate of, of how much more delta V we would need. Okay, so uh, next please. Uh, in the case, uh, obviously you saw when we went to that 295.0 target, the 2A case was slower. Um, so one thing we can do is perhaps pick an alternative uh, destination, an alternative direction for the 2A case that actually boosts our speed even though we have the same mass estimate. So uh, you'll note that by the figures on the right, the 2039 hot zone roughly aligns with the 284 degree longitude. And if we want to try to fly through the IVEX ribbon and stay near 45 degrees off the nose, we decided to pick a destination that was actually just 12 degrees off the ecliptic, still, still very fast and, and still achieving most of, the, most of the objectives that we set forth. Um, so this is a tentative modification to um, our 2A option that actually gets us 7.68 AU per year. Um, a considerable speed, speed boost and time reduction on the mission. Um, another way to think of this is we could actually use this alternative destination as our prime case launching in 2039, and then we could use the ballistic 1A option to 295.0 in 2041 as our backup. Okay, um, that's it for me. Uh, and now Dave Copeland wanted to discuss uh, telecommunications. Yeah. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, my name is Dave Copeland and I'll present the uh, telecommunications trades that we are looking at for this uh, mission. Could you go to the next slide, please? Let's start by talking about the basic physics of the problem. Uh, what is it that actually sets the data rate that a link could support? Uh, Data rate is going to go with uh, the receive signal to noise ratio on the ground. And we can calculate this um, showing here a simplified version of the Friss equation, which shows us what are the basic constraints for data rate and also what are the parameters in the design that we can tune. These are shown over to the right. Uh, first and foremost, we're dominated by the distance. The data rate's gonna fall off as one over the distance squared. Data rate is going to be directly proportional to the output power, and it's going to be directly proportional to the size of the receiving antenna uh, measured by its effective area. Uh, the sensitivity of the ground station uh, figures in as well, and, and data rate is going to go inversely proportional to the receiving noise temperature. These last two items, it gets a little bit messier. Uh, you know, by the equation, we should be able to see an increase in data rate uh, with the operating frequency squared but it never quite works out to be this clean. Uh, and it's tied very much to the transmitting antenna area. And the reason for this is that uh, the gain is often uh, gonna be limited here by the pointing error. So we can have a extremely large high gain antenna on the spacecraft, but it does us no good if we can't point it at earth. And uh, so this ties uh, this antenna area and the operating frequency together and uh, um, makes the problem a more complicated problem. Can you go to the next slide? So, and from this, we get our trade space. Uh, I show this from left to right, but they are very much intertwined. Starting on the left, uh, first off is beam pointing control. How are we going to take a highly directional antenna and point it back towards Earth? The spacecraft such as New Horizons and Voyager used a body fixed antenna uh, and is counting on the spacecraft itself pointing that antenna towards Earth. That's gonna be limited here by our ability to control that uh, pointing vector. And this limit is about 0.2 degrees. To get any tighter pointing than this 0.2 degrees, we're going to have to pull the pointing control into the subsystem itself and using some form of active pointing system that's going to be independent of the spacecraft. This can certainly be done 
and is done on current missions. The complication here is that we need to do this in a way that is going to last for a nominal mission lifetime of 50 years. And if we want the mission to ultimately make it out to 1,000 AU, it's going to have to last for about 133 years. Uh, tied in with this is both the choice of the antenna aperture size, uh, the technology we're using for the antenna, and then the frequency that we're operating at. So nominal frequencies for deep space missions is X-band and K-A-band. We've done missions at both. Um, and the way of thinking of frequency here uh, is that it basically maps uh, directivity of that antenna to the physical size of the aperture. So you get higher gain out of an antenna as you raise the frequency uh, to a first order. There are secondary effects that will limit this. Um, but again, it does us no good if we can't point that. Optical is on the table uh, for this mission, and it is sort of represents the ultimate uh, in that trade, in that you can get extremely high, essentially, gain out of your transmit uh, antenna, or transmit aperture, for a very small size aperture, but you're going to have to now point it to within, you know, micro radians or nano radians. And again, how do you do that for something that's going to last over 50 years? So the antenna size itself is a, uh, um, a major uh, parameter to tune here. And as you can see, it really is a big driver for both the mass of the spacecraft and it dominates the spacecraft layout. So uh, choosing an antenna size that basically optimizes that space uh, is what we've been working on. Uh, typically for our, you know, uh, we would use a solid uh, antenna but that's going to drive mass. So one of the things we're looking at as well is what other technologies can we apply to that antenna to bring its mass down, such as a mesh antenna or a membrane antenna. So as you saw in the previous slide, the uh, size of the uh, aperture on the ground is a major driver here. So the DSN is, uh, the NASA's Deep Space Network, is how we talk to our uh, deep space missions now. Um, and what we are seeing is that uh, we really could use more aperture on the ground uh, to keep the uh, spacecraft parameters within something that we consider feasible. So in addition to the DSN, we're also taking a look at what if we were to increase the size of the aperture on the ground? And uh, notionally here, what if we were to go to something the size of the NGVLA, which is now a much larger array of dishes that is uh, in the process of being brought online. For optical, this would, of course, be a telescope as well. The last trade that we're looking at, uh, it comes down to how do we scale that transmit power? So as we saw, data rate's going to go directly proportional to transmit power. But that transmit power is a major power draw on the spacecraft. Uh, and scaling that to maintain flexibility in the mission design uh, is a real concern. What do we do if uh, our TG fails? And how do we scale this? if we want to go into an extended mission now uh, where we're going out to 1,000 AU. Okay, next slide, please. So this shows our baseline uh, design and the trajectory that we have right now through that trade space. This is an X-band uh, system, and this is a system with very high heritage. And we felt that this was important to show that you could fly this mission uh, by uh, using a system on the spacecraft that we essentially could build now. Uh, there is uh, um, a lot of commonality between all these components to things that uh, is commonly used in deep space. It's dominated by a five meter high gain antenna. Uh, we added to that a uh, medium gain antenna and two LGAs, low gain antennas. Uh, these are used mainly in the first year of the mission. And this is more for commissioning and uh, maneuvers going out to Jupiter. Now, as you can see, the subsystem mass is dominated by this high gain antenna. So this is driving a lot of the work now is what can we do to actually bring this mass down? You can go to the next slide. So other trajectories to that, through that trade space, we're now looking at what can we do to bring that down? Uh, most obvious thing to, to attack is what are we making that antenna out of? So we're now taking a look at, so what if we were to go to a more advanced material for that antenna, such as a, a, such as a membrane design, keep the antenna size the same, keep uh, frequency operation at X-band, 
but now bring that mass down. And this does look like it is possible. We're also looking at a KA band option. And it's interesting here <clears throat> that we're looking at KA band primarily for mass, not necessarily for a data rate uh, increase, although we do get a small amount of data rate increase here. And here we can drop the size of that high gain. Now, the problems in so doing uh, is that we are going to have to have some form of secondary pointing control within the subsystem, something that is either steering the subreflector um, or some way so that we can actively point now and not rely on the spacecraft. So you're now starting to introduce additional complexity into the spacecraft design. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of the power amp scaling, so uh, the nominal mission design is for 50 years and for two RTGs, uh, we can get 300 watts out of this. Out of this, uh, the telecom subsystem counts for about 100 watts. So our nominal design and laying out our power budget, we feel we can get an RF power of 52 watts out of our TWTAs for this design. And this is well within uh, capabilities of current uh, TWTAs. You could basically buy this tube now. Now, the problem though comes into what happens if an RTG fails? Uh, we still have to power the rest of the spacecraft and power amps are going to draw a certain amount of power no matter what you do. So if the uh, power amp is scaled in such a way that it simply doesn't fit into these alternative power budgets, then we've lost comms. And this could actually drive us to have to reduce the amount of power that's coming out of these power amps or start taking a look at more complex ways of uh, doing that power amp section such that both its DC power and its output power can be scaled in such ways to handle these cases. Uh, and similar to the failed RTG case is what do we do now um, once we've gone past our baseline mission of 50 years, if we're trying to shoot all the way out to 1000 AU, we know that the RTGs are going to degrade further. Uh, so uh, how and then do we scale uh, that power amp size such that we're not limiting our uh, flexibility there and trying to go into an extended mission? Next slide, please. We're also working on the communications concept of operations. So now laying it, uh, basically how would we fly this mission and how would we talk to it at different phases? So the mission lays out in uh, three fundamental phases, an inner heliosphere uh, phase and uh, out to 70 AU, an outer heliosphere phase out to 250 AU, and then at the interstellar phase. A lot of what we're used to doing in missions actually is going on in that inner heliosphere phase. And so we've added some more detail as to how would we operate the mission uh, during this phase. So we know there's going to be a LEOP phase and, and basically a commissioning phase. This more or less extends out to Jupiter and we will hit that Jupiter flyby within a year of launch. And so in this phase, we're assuming that we can fly um, on primarily the MGA. You can use that the uh, LGA is closer in. So we're not really counting on bringing the high gain into play until after we pass Jupiter. We're also uh, planning on staying on the DSN through this phase. Uh, and in fact, we're looking at trying to uh, laying uh, the operations out such that we are on the DSN for the first 10 years of the mission and slowly stepping up capability in the DSN, starting with a single 34 meter station and then starting to array stations together uh, to build up that capability. So we basically have 10 years then to now on the ground bring in a higher aperture capability such as the NGVLA. As we cross that 70 AU boundary, we're now counting on being able to switch uh, to that higher capability. Uh, we are making an assumption right now, at that point we could do a contact every two weeks. When we get out to the interstellar phase, uh, out past uh, about 2076, then now we need to uh, increase the contact time simply because that data rate, again, is falling off as distance squared. So we have to increase our amount of contact time to keep the science data uh, overall rate up. Next slide, please. And one way of thinking about that uh, in terms of uh, planning out this concept of operations and how this ties into the overall capability of the system is if we basically boil this down to what it is what we're trying to do. Uh, fundamentally, we need to put an instrument suite out at distance 
and we need to funnel data from that instrument suite back to a science team. Every other decision that we make sort of gets lumped into a black box, which defines the size of that pipe. We characterize that in terms of the bits per second. By the time it gets to the science team, it's still an information rate. So it comes down to what is basically the information rate that the mission needs to fundamentally do the science we need to do. Uh, so you can think of it as bits per second, eventually becoming cool new discoveries per month. Uh, we've characterized that here by uh, taking both the pr performance of the system and our assumptions for the concept of operations and calculating what would be the weekly data volume that you will get back from the spacecraft. Divide that by the number of seconds in a week and what you get is an effective data rate, which is basically the size of that pipe shown to the left. And I've shown that in the graph that's here to the right uh, for both the nominal mission, which goes out to about the orange line, and then all the way out to 1,000 AU. And so this is fundamentally the size of information flow that we can get from that suite to the science team. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. And now we're gonna have our question and answer session. So the first question, um, Jim actually mentioned it in the Q&A, but we can discuss it as a group. And it's from William Kurth. And does payload mass include radiation shielding for the Jupiter gravity assist? So Jim, can you comment on that? Sure, I sure can. Uh, so as we, I mentioned in the um, uh, a quick answer to the question, um, we have considered the radiation environment associated with the gr Jupiter gravity assist. Um, that's probably on the order of 100 kilorads uh, for the, uh, pretty much for the entire mission. It's, there is a contribution associated with the RTGs. Um, we uh, have, uh, mass margin and mass set aside for uh, shielding associated with uh, uh, both the spacecraft and the instruments, but the details of how that would all work. To some extent, we can provide some details, but to some extent also we need to wait until the instruments themselves are actually selected in a future mission uh, to be able to, to work the details. But there is uh, plenty of mass available to be able to shield the instruments and the spacecraft. Thanks, Jim. The next question is for Dave and it's from Mike G and it's, do you plan one spare TWTA or more? Could you comment on that, Dave? Sure, uh, and this is a good question. Uh, the uh, uh, baseline design is flying two TWTAs that are scaled in such a way that they are redundant. You don't have to have both TWTAs there to meet that uh, science goal at 50 years. Um, but this is abs you know, absolutely something we need to take a look at in terms of the overall reliability study is that, is that sufficient to guarantee reliability for 50 years or more? Um, and what are going to be the fundamental life limiting items uh, in each, any of these components? You know, for TWTA, you have to take a look at basically how long is that cathode gonna last? Um, and to be honest, we need to take a look at this for each electronic part or at least elect each electronic box? It's a good question. Thanks, Dave. And the next question is from Ryan Bull, and it's how will you do navigation that far out? Um, Jim, can you comment on that one? Uh, I can comment a little bit, and then I'll hand it over to Wayne if he's uh, maybe got a better answer. Uh, navigation is one of the things that we're, we're concerned about, and we actually have a small group of people who are starting to look at how you might do navigation when you're that far away from the Earth and when the round trip light times uh, are significantly long. Uh, so Wayne, do you have any more information about uh, some ways that we might be able to do that? Um, I would just, I definitely would say that this is of high interest. We're definitely looking at it. Um, uh, I, I think we'll rely on what New Horizons has done in the past, but obviously we have to go well beyond what has been done. Uh, so this is definitely worth further study. Yep, and just to add to that, we do, like I said, we do have several people um, who are already working that problem, and that's uh, something that I think we'll probably be answering uh, as part of next year's work. All right, thank you very much. The next question is from Suraj Kumar, and is the team considering electric or other advanced propulsion systems such as nuclear thermal prop propulsion for the study? Um, Jim, I'll hand this one to you. Sure, no problem. Uh, so I would remind everybody that, uh, and this is one of the things we talked about in some of the early uh, webinars, that uh, one of the, the prime uh, assumptions for the study that we were given by NASA headquarters was that we consider uh, technology that would be, be available as early as 2030 for a launch. 
And so when you look at that, what that means is we really need to have something that's a very high TRL um, or about to be very high TRL within the next uh, several years um, to be able to, to uh, incorporate it into this mission. So there are things that are being developed that I think that are further out. Uh, you know, uh, nuclear electric propulsion is one of those. Uh, things like solar sail propulsion and things like that that may very well come to fruition in the future. Um, but we can't really count on them right now. Uh, so our system is basically designed uh, to take into account um, very high TRL or, or uh, high heritage kinds of kind of systems. And it looks like we can accomplish the mission that the scientists um, have said is the mission that needs to be done uh, using those technologies. Thanks, Jim. And the next question is from Prasneet Javin. And is there any benefit to ejecting parts of the spacecraft that are no longer useful to reduce mass? The premise of this question is that if it was mentioned that the mission has different phases, inner heliosphere, outer even further, so maybe not all equipment is used in all phases. Um, example, some of the small antennas, et cetera. So I don't know if Jim, you wanna take that and then we can pass it along to some of the other members. Yep, I can start with that. There, there actually isn't all that much benefit from um, ejecting parts of the spacecraft as you're as you're talking about. It is certainly true that you could reduce the mass, and so the mass, and so maybe uh, guidance control gets a little easier. Um, but uh, as Wayne talked about, we don't have to do things like trajectory correction when we get out past Jupiter, at, um, at least in the case where we're not doing a planetary flyby um, or KBO flyby or something like that. And so. Uh, there really isn't a whole lot of benefit to it. Uh, it's certainly something that, that could be done, but the question is whether you would uh, have a system that, where that could be done reliably after, let's say, five years or 10 years in space. Um, and so I think that's a, probably a, something considered for the future, but not really a, a prime trade that we're worried about right now. Okay, thanks, Jim. And the next question is from Jeff Morrill. Do you have plans for the development of spacecraft autonomy software for the use during portions of the flight at extreme distances and long round trip communication times? So I can give that so, to Jim as well. Yeah. Yep, no problem. So the answer is most definitely yes. Um, our spacecraft autonomy is gonna be very sophisticated. Um, we made our first steps with that with Parker Solar Probe and some of the autonomy that's in place there. Uh, that we'll be taking that sort of to the next step even yet. Um, and even to the point where we're even looking at things like uh, AI, uh, uh, enhanced autonomy, um, the ability to do uh, onboard error detection and correction uh, without ground intervention, uh, those kinds of things. So, um, so yeah, those are definitely things that we're considering and are probably going to be fairly critical for the mission in the sense that we want to make sure that, that a spacecraft can take care of itself in light of the difficulty of communicating with it. Okay, thanks, Jim. The next question um, is from Ralph McNutt. I think it's more of a comment and, and Dave can and perhaps uh, speak to it is, might be worth noting that reaction wheels, so active precision pointing of an HGA, are life limited and fall short of the required 50 year lifetime, hence the various elements in the trade space on the con system. Yeah, and this is exactly right. And this is what is driving, uh, in fact, that entire discussion. You know, for other missions, uh, such as Parker Solar Probe, uh, where KA band was just um, uh, an absolute uh, lifesaver and enabler for the mission. Uh, you're able to fully exploit the aperture size you have on the spacecraft because you can point the antenna precisely enough. And this is because you've got reaction wheels on the spacecraft. For this mission, where we are going to be pr propulsion only, uh, we simply can't guarantee that we're going to have that uh, foresight of that antenna pointed that uh, well to, to Earth. Thanks, Dave. And our last question is from Mike Gruntman, and he said he might have missed it, but what are the assumed conversion efficiencies of a next-gen RTG? I can hand that to Jim. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so I don't have the number in my head, unfortunately, uh, but I know that, uh, so one of the things that we've done is been in contact with the RPS program office. Uh, they provided a, a set of assumptions for conversion efficiency and power output. Uh, masses, um, all of those sorts of things that were used for, uh, that can be used for, for concept studies and we're consistent with all of those uh, specifications. And uh, I can try to get the, the information later if someone would like to see that. Okay. Thank you very much, Jim. Mm -hmm. And that's all the time that we have for today. Um, so thank you very much to all of our panelists and thank you for attending today's webinar. The next webinar will be on Thursday, September 17th at noon Eastern time.
where we will have a presentation by several members of the Interstellar Probe Study Engineering Team on the current status of the Long Duration Mission Study, which is part of the Interstellar Probe Study. Please visit the Interstellar Probe Study website for more information on the Interstellar Probe Study and to view information on future webinars and events. Also, please consider signing up for our listserv under the Community Involvement section of the website to make sure you're getting the latest information on upcoming webinars and events.